Well, I am excited and honored to sit down today with Holly Christine Hayes. She's an award-winning author and founder and CEO of Sanctuary Project, a survivor-run nonprofit community providing job training and employment to women coming out of trafficking, violence, and addiction. After working in worship and recovery ministry from Menlo Church in California and the American Church in Paris, Holly married her husband, Jeff, in 2016, and they now reside in Austin, Texas. In July of 2019, they welcomed their daughter, Havana, into their family. Holly has spoken in safe houses, churches, conferences, and recovery communities all over the world and was recently chosen as a new voice for women of faith. She has traveled the globe, sharing her radical story of salvation and coming to faith in Christ from one simple, desperate prayer. And she is passionate about teaching others to pray that prayer too. God, help me. Welcome, Holly. I'm so honored and excited to have you on the Make Life Matter podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a joy. I hope I pronounced your daughter's name right. I just realized Havana, Havana. Havana. Yeah. Just like the city in Cuba. Love it. Which love it. we actually learned means breath of grace, which I just thought was so, so beautiful. And then it's been this really beautiful prophetic picture and word over her life. Um, she came two months early and had um, breath in her lungs actually, and didn't have, mm. didn't a respirator. And then uh, of course she entered the world um, in, in 2020, you know, just oh. coming into 2020 where, um, where breath is, um, has been a, a valuable mm. uh, commodity. And, and so we're, uh, we're just amazed at how God gave us that name for her and how it's, and how it's already been so sweet and prophetic mm. over her life. Well, congratulations on being a new mom. That's exciting. Thank just in the last year and a half then. Yeah, she's 18 months today, actually. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, yeah. I was connected with you through Rebecca Lyons' podcast. I listened to it. And anyone who knows me knows that I have never met a pair of Staven earrings that I do not love. <laughs> so um, I am all things jewelry. And so instantly I was connected. I immediately looked you up on Instagram and looked up the Sanctuary Project. And I know we're going to talk about that in a moment, but you have such a powerful, riveting story. And I know that you've seen God just do extraordinary things through your life and the way he's redeemed some situations. So I would love to just invite you to share your story with our listeners, especially anyone who is new to meeting you for the first time. Yeah. So um, I grew up in a home that was not a family of faith. Um, I, I, I'd never really met any Christians. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, it was a very secular community. Both my parents were professors and in education. And, and I grew up in this very intellectual home that worshipped, I would say, achievement and science. Um, and so uh, I never would have imagined that I would become a person of faith. But in my young life, there were some traumas that happened. I had some sexual abuse in my young childhood. And then my parents divorced in my uh, young teen years. And after both of those things, I spiraled into a cycle of alcohol and drug abuse that led to some really horrific places. Mm -hmm. By 15, I was drinking and using drugs every day. By 16, I uh, dropped out of high school and, um, and got into my first abusive relationship and had my first of five abortions. By 18, I was getting arrested all the time and, um, and had really uh, fallen out of what you would deem as sort of the normal society. Um, everyone I associated with was uh, drug dealers and, um, and sex workers. And, um, and that was when I started and entered into the sex world uh, myself. And at 19, I met my trafficker. I met him at a party and he immediately could see that I was a perfect target for his exploitation. Mm -hmm. I, had, um, I, I had that perfect combination of trauma and leading with my sexuality and an addiction that left me dependent on um, any means necessary to, to, to fix that need. So um, that exploitation happened for a couple of years. Um, that relationship became really violent early on. And, and then he started arranging um, uh, arranging this trafficking situation. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm lucky or just a failure, but I kept getting drunk and high and not showing up for the jobs he was lining mm. up for me. So I went one lower in society than being trafficked. I actually failed at being trafficked <laughs> and, um, and got kicked out. And so he, um, he uh, after he kicked me out, I ended up homeless. Mm. And I was on the floor of a public bathroom in February of 2001, and I, I was watching my tears hit the floor. And I just said, God, help me. Mm. 
and I'd never believed in God and had no experience with God, but at, at the end of my self, it was all I could think to say. That very night, I ended up meeting someone who got me into a recovery program, and I've been sober since that day. It'll be 20 years, February 11th, um, and, uh, and got away from my trafficker and started this journey to a whole new life. I didn't know it was Jesus at that moment, but ended up meeting Jesus uh, later through a course of events in a stolen Bible. Uh, that's a, <laughs> whole, a whole other story. But, <laughs> but as soon as I, um, as soon as I opened that, uh, that stolen Bible for the first time, uh, I opened it to the story in John eight, where Jesus forgives the adulterous woman. Hmm. And, um, and it was my first introduction to this Jesus. And it was so clear in that moment that this was the God that saved me off that bathroom floor and that, mm. that this is the God that goes around to public bathrooms, picking girls like me up and mm. giving them a whole new life. And so um, I dedicated a lot of my life to ministry and uh, worked as a worship leader. And then uh, ultimately was after years of volunteering in um, anti-trafficking, felt really called to starting my own anti-trafficking organization, working uh, exclusively with other survivors. Wow. What a powerful story. There's just so many directions that I would love to go and so many things I want to ask you. You know, we just don't think, or maybe we don't want to think, Holly, that it's right here in our backyard, but it really is. I have been overseas in Romania and some parts of Africa, and I live right here outside of Washington, D.C., which we've talked about is sadly the the, the capital of, of trafficking um, right here in our country. So is it, do you think that people's eyes are intentionally not open because they don't want to believe it's right here? Or what are you finding to be the case as far as awareness? I believe now people are talking about it more. Our head is out of the sand. Um, what is it that we can do to even help people understand it is right here to recognize the signs, especially if it happens to be someone close to you or someone that you love? Yeah, I think one of the biggest reasons we don't see it here is there's a lot of misconceptions about what trafficking is and mm. what it looks like. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have in their head this picture of either what they've seen overseas where a lot of times it's poverty driven and it's parents selling their children into the big cities. Um, I think in America, we, we tend to, to get this picture in our head of maybe the movie Taken where, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's kids being kidnapped and sold on the black market. And so we think, well, you know, surely we would be hearing more about this if, if this was really going on. But, um, but it's actually a lot more nuanced than that and a lot more mm. manipulated than that. Uh, a lot of the reason we have trouble seeing trafficking is that trafficking survivors themselves are not even often able to articulate or identify as a trafficking survivor. Um, you know, even I coming out of trafficking would not have been able to give it that name. I wasn't aware that what was happening in my situation was a trafficking situation. I knew mm -hmm. it was violent. I knew that I had an addiction that I was struggling with, um, but I didn't know, and, and I, knew that, I knew that he had arranged something I was very uncomfortable with, but I wouldn't have known to put that name on it. And so I think really educating people about what trafficking is and sharing stories like mine, which are a very common story for, mm -hmm. for the kind of trafficking you see here in America, um, the more we can get as real stories out there, the more we're going to help other women to identify and say, yep, me too. That's what's been going on for me. You know, a lot of times people think um, that, that they have to do this. And, um, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of cases, trafficking is happening through a known person. It's happening by a boyfriend or a family member. And so if, you know, if someone's in something like that, they're not necessarily saying, please rescue me, I need to escape, mm. because they think that this person loves them and they think that this is the only way to survive. Mm. So do you think in those situations, people are equating that feeling of loved with actually being used in a way, and maybe they're not able to, to understand the difference, or they haven't experienced love in a more true, authentic form, or what, I guess, what propels a woman to not even understand maybe that this is what's happening to me, and it feels like love, but it really isn't. Yeah, abusers understand the, the dopamine effect of what happens in relationships when there's a heightened situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you've, if you've developed a relationship with someone, usually they'll come in and they'll be that trustworthy person, right? I mean, with my trafficker early on, he seemed like the best guy ever. And mm -hmm. we bonded and he was very sweet and he, you know, 
very charming and really pursued me and made me feel special. And then, you know, as, as the relationship became more violent, I actually started bonding more with him because every time the relationship got violent, there was this dopamine effect of there was violence and then there was making up and there was violence and there was making up. And so that actually bonded me to him because it felt like we'd been through things together. So it's really creating this false sense of bonding and attachment to this person because of that dopamine effect. Mm. So then when, um, you know, when, when he started to, to manipulate the situation to, you know, to begin the trafficking scenario, um, he actually presented it as though you are so valuable, you know, women, women like you would, you know, go for this much on the market Mm -hmm. and really made it seem like he thought I was so valuable that he wanted to be able to, um, he wanted other people to be able to enjoy me. Um, and, and, and so it was, it was really manipulative, right? Because here's this person saying, you're so valuable. We're going to make sure you get all of your value. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and I love you, even though this is violence. So, so it's the, there's so much going on and so much manipulation going on. And if it's a family member, you know, the, the women we've worked with where it's a family member, it's even worse, right? Because there's so much attachment, natural attachment you have and trust you have with a family member. So as we're working with women coming out of it, we have to remember that we're untangling very deep bonds in a lot of cases. Mm. That's really impacting. That's, that's good to know for someone who maybe not be familiar with the ins and outs of, of trafficking and how it can happen far easier than we think. What is one of the main things you want to say to someone to say, listen, this is a major misconception about trafficking. And this is something that we need to do to, to remedy that misconception. Well, you know, right now there's interesting misconceptions floating around because there's, um, there's a lot of talk of child sex trafficking and, um, um, and in relation to um, even conspiracy theories that are out right. there. Right. And, and so I think it's important to, um, to untangle, um, you know, what is real, what is actually happening um, with some things that are meant to emotionally charge us. Mm. Um, and, you know, what I found is the fruit of that emotional charging sort of conspiracy theory type trafficking you're hearing about is the fruit of it is fear. Um, you know, there, you have a whole bunch of moms who are like, oh my gosh, my kid is going to be stolen at the grocery store, stolen out of a window. And um, really that's not what we see. And so um, I'm going to share this hopefully to bring some peace to loving mothers out there who have, who have been fearful. Um, you know, we are not seeing a lot of children being taken from loving homes and, um, and sold on the black market. That is a very, very, very rare thing. Most of the time, what we're seeing in trafficking scenarios is children who are, uh, who lack supervision and who lack that um, supportive, maybe two family or or two parent family household. Um, A lot of times in the foster care system, those are the children that we're most, uh, that we're seeing most exploited. And it's because the traffickers are smart and they're going for easy prey. Mm. They know that if they can get someone who doesn't have the parental supervision, it's going to be easier than getting someone who has the mom who's picking them up from school every day and is, um, you know, and knows who all their friends are. And so traffickers are targeting those vulnerable children who don't have the supervision, who don't have the, the two parent house, um, and, and maybe who are putting themselves out there online looking for attention and looking for that affirmation that they're loved and they're accepted and they're okay. Mm-hmm. The traffickers will comb Instagram, Snapchat, any social media platforms and look for young adolescents and young women and children who are looking for likes because they know if they can come in and be that person who says, oh girl, you're the, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And I can't believe you don't have a boyfriend. Let's meet up. Mm-hmm. That it's going to be easy to pull that person into that situation. Mm, that's great information for us. And I was thinking as you were sharing that we live in such an over-sexualized culture and, and with social media, it certainly made it easier for, for young girls, younger and younger to just feel like, here's my worth, here's my value, you know, here's my body on display. We're not the only country who's over-sexualized, but are you finding that to be a factor in girls being, as you said, even maybe more vulnerable and more susceptible to, oh my goodness, this person likes me, thinks I'm beautiful. How are you finding that to be a piece of the equation? 
Absolutely. I think, I think kids are getting more and more uh, comfortable with sec- being sexualized younger and younger. Mm. And so, um, so even, you know, some of the Snapchat filters, like I'll, you know, like I'll see these Snapchat filters and it's like, it gives these girls these big lips and big eyes and all this makeup and, you know, and it's all, it's all this very hypersexualized uh, visual. And so that's doing two things. One, it's getting used, it's getting the girls used to seeing themselves that way and seeing their value attached to that. But on the other side, it's getting the men used to seeing women that way. Mm. And so one of the biggest issues we have, if not the biggest issue we have when it comes to sex trafficking is that this is not going to stop until the demand for purchasing yes, sex. Exactly. And so as men are, are easily uh, able to, to get access to images and uh, you know, sexual images and, um, and, and the more men are, are stimulated in that way, the more it's unfortunately gonna drive that, um, that business, the more it's, it's gonna drive men to purchasing sex. Mm. And you know, whether that's purchasing pornography, purchasing a, a live girl, um, either way, they're, they're, they're feeding that industry. And so we have to be so careful about um, what messages we're putting out there into the world um, with our young people, not just with our girls, but also also with our boys. Mm, that's so good because that's that's the that's the part of this equation we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is the demand for it. Whether it's overseas or right here in our own country, if the demand stops, then so much of it would cease. It'd be so easy to just stop it at the demand point. But you make an, an excellent point, Holly, is that we can't just talk about the women and the girls and their need for value and worth. And we have to ground our worth in Christ and all those things we know to be true intellectually. We have to get that into our heart and we have to get the message into the hearts of men, you know, and, and only the Holy Spirit can really change a heart and transform a heart. But as moms, especially if you're listening and you're a mom, you're a dad, you know, you're a young adult, it's, it's never too early or too late to say, let me see what I can do to, to re shift the narrative and to make sure we introduce this narrative. I have a, a, a 24 year old daughter and I have a 20 year old, 21 year old son. So I've navigated both sides of this coin to try to help my son see the value of women far beyond their looks and and their worth and to honor and respect women. And if we can get that message across, we can hopefully shift the need for demand. Any thoughts you have on that from the perspective of addressing men and boys? Well, you know, I wish I could say, um, let's stop the demand and, you mm-hmm. know, and that, and that addresses yeah. the issue, but basically that we're saying let's stop sin, right? Yeah. Um, and so as, you know, as long as, um, as long as there's sin in the hearts of men and women, mm. this is, this is going to be a part of what we have to deal with as a society. Mm. The good news is our eyes are open to it. Um, the good news is Christ redeems all things. So while we may not see demand for sex stop until Jesus's return, um, and I pray we do, but I also, I also am realistic that, that sin, um, and especially sexual sin and desire is not going to stop. Like that's not, you know, like you can't tell men stop desiring sex. Um, or, <laughs> we've yeah. all tried that with our husbands at some point, <laughs> I'm not sure. Work. Let me know how that works yeah. out. Yeah, if anyone knows, d- DM us. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think, but I think the more we can educate men about what happens when you purchase pornography, what happens when you purchase mm. sex, how is it hurting on the other side? I think um, the more education that's out there, the better. But, um, mm. but for me, really what I feel the most called to is let's work on the restoration and the redemption of these lives, mm. because that is one thing I know we can see in this life. Lifetime. I know and believe that every single heart of every single person who has been trapped in a life of trafficking can be redeemed by the love of Jesus Christ. And so mm-hmm. I'm so excited that I get to partner in that redemptive process and, and say, yes, there's always going to be sin in the world, but I get to be part of the God using all things together for good for those who are in him and called according to their purposes. I love it. I love it. And that's a wonderful segue into really one of the primary ways that you're doing that, Holly, besides your story and your voice in our generation, which is so needed and so valued. And thank you for your commitment to championing women. But talk about the Sanctuary Project. How was this birthed? What does it do? And how can we be a part of it? Yeah, so uh, I spent uh, a 
I spent a lot of time in the anti-trafficking movement, just, um, you know, mentoring other girls who were coming out of trafficking and, and really just trying to understand the nuances and how it's different in each country, like you talked about in Romania and Africa and Southeast Asia, um, and, and visiting organizations in all those different places to really understand what is the, what is the issue look like here and what does the, the help look like here? Um, I, I didn't see enough work help uh, happening here in the United States. And what I realized was there's so much talk about trafficking over there. There was so much talk about all the, the trafficking in Thailand, the trafficking in Africa, tra trafficking in Romania, right? There's so much talk about over there and very little talk and very little work happening here in, in the United States. And so being a survivor of trafficking here, I felt very strongly we needed to build something here. Um, I used one of my favorite models I had seen as I visited ministries around the world. Um, we were talking about this earlier, but I visited a wonderful organization in Thailand called Nightlight and another one there called uh, Rahab Ministries. And both organizations were working with women coming out of the brothels and training them to make jewelry. And so I saw them sitting in a circle together making jewelry with each other, laughing, um, sharing the beautiful thing they just made, and their friends all lighting up and, and saying, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. And, and then them lighting up and, and seeing the shift in their identity from being on display, being exploited to being someone who makes beautiful things. And so all day long, they got to just make beautiful things and, and reshape their identity in that community. And so I took that model and said, um, I want to do it here. And uh, I've always been kind of a fashion girl. And, um, you know, after living in Paris, France for several years, I really uh, fell in love with their sort of minimalist style around jewelry. Everything is very elegant, very understated, um, and found that a lot of what the, the other social enterprises were doing was more bold and um, statementy. And, and so I wanted to, to find a niche for for that, that soft, dainty, elegant, uh, minimalist girl who, uh, you know, who likes a gold stud or, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and really have something that, um, that any woman could wear and love and feel beautiful in, but that they could uh, start to talk about our mission. Uh, every time they get a compliment on their necklace, they get to have a conversation about trafficking and about what it looks like here in America and what we're doing about it. And you actually employ women, my understanding is you employ women that work with making the jewelry right here in the United States. Is that correct? They're a, a key part of it. Not just making jewelry. So actually every single woman we employ at every aspect of our business is a survivor. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of organizations who are employing women to make jewelry or maybe to package and ship, but um, but we really believe that survivors can be so much more than um, just the person that makes the jewelry or ships it out. Uh, so we have survivors in every single role in our company, every, you know, from me as CEO to my director of operations, to my program manager, to our social media manager, um, you know, our shipping manager, every single, every single woman in our company is a survivor. Mm -hmm. And it's created such a special environment because the women who are newer and coming into our job training program where they are making jewelry and, and shipping jewelry are able to look up at look up to us and say, oh, maybe one day I want to be a creative director, or I want to be a social media manager, or I want to get my, my counseling degree and be a program manager. And they're able to look at us and say, maybe one day I can be a CEO instead of, instead of that feeling that, um, oh, well, you know, I'm, I, all I have is a high school education. So all I can do is this. We really want them to feel like the sky's the limit with what they can do and their skill set. I love it. I could not love it more. I'm sad because I ordered a piece of jewelry and it didn't make it. We talked about it and she's no. wearing this bracelet that I ordered. We would have been twinsies today. Oh, well, you'll get to wear it. You'll get I to wear it every know. day once it goes. <laughs> when the podcast airs, I'll wear it that day and talk about it. And I love, and, and I work with women in Africa, not trafficking survivors, but I work primarily with rural women in, in very poverty stricken areas. And a lot of them pastor's wives. I'm a pastor's wife myself outside of Washington, DC. And I saw the difference that micro enterprise could make in their lives. And if they just needed an opportunity, they needed that startup capital to just begin their own you know, whether it was doing something in the market or making jewelry or one person went on to develop, you know, a line of makeup and now she does weddings. And, you know, I was able to go back and visit some of these women and just see what the, just a small amount of capital, the difference that it makes in their lives and the difference in their dignity. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, you know, it's not just handing them a handout. It's saying, listen, you have worth and value and there's, you can create something 
and we were created to create. So I love being a part of that. I've seen firsthand, like you mentioned, just the, the joy that you've seen in their faces, thinking that God is not only redeeming their story, but is using them to create something of such beauty and value. And um, so I, I'm going to ask you to pray over our listeners in just a moment. But if we have time, I always like to ask my guest for them to maybe take a moment and let them be the one asking a question. I have my guesses of who your answer is going to be, but I don't, I don't want to give it away. So if you, when you get to heaven, if you have a chance to interview any one of your choice, who would that be? And what would you like to ask them? Oh, that's easy peasy. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, for sure, the woman caught in adultery. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, scholars kind of vary on like, was that Mary Magdalene or, I mean, I want to talk to Mary Magdalene too, if it wasn't her, sure. if it was her, it, I have a lot of questions, but, um, for sure her, I want to know what Jesus wrote in the sand. Mm. I want to know, uh, that's the first thing I want to know. I want to know, oh, I'm going to cry. Yeah. When I read that story for the first time, I felt like he had a message for me that he wanted to write in the sand to me. Um, and that my life was going to be discovering what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think he has that for each of us in his redemptive story, but I just so desperately want to know what, what he said to her that, um, you know, that completely transformed her life. Mm, that's so powerful. I got goosebumps all over when you said that, to think about that, there's something he's writing in the sand for each one of us and redeeming the parts of our life that he doesn't want us to live in shame. He doesn't want us mm -hmm. to live in brokenness. He wants us to live in wholeness. And just the thought of him lifting her up out of that moment and saying, you know, go and embrace your new transformed life. And she was there at the cross. I mean, she was there. She was the first person to see him after he came yeah. out of the tomb. I mean, yeah, my goodness, what, yeah. what a story of transformation and redemption. And that's the story that he has for each of us. So if you're listening and you've never had this encounter I love you saying, Holly, the God that would meet a girl on a bathroom floor, like he meets us wherever we are. And there's no place that he won't go. There's no place he can't find us. He can't rescue us. He can't redeem us and he can't use us. And so thank you so much for just being a person to say, yes, God, change me, use me. And you really won't even know till heaven the, the how many thousands and thousands of women's lives and men that you're impacting for the kingdom. So thank you so much. And I know people might be hearing about you for the first time. And so I want them to know how they can find you, how they can connect with you. I know you have a book they could purchase. And of course, the Sanctuary Project, we want them to go buy all the things on the website. So let us know how they can find you and how they can connect with you. Yeah. So our website, sanctuaryproject.com, you can shop our line there. Um, we're also available on target.com now, which is really incredible. So you can, you can find us there. Yeah. Um, and then we're most active on Instagram. So at sanctuary underscore project, if you want to find me and follow me, you can follow me at, uh, at Holly Christine Hayes and, um, and then book is available on Amazon as well. It's called from basement to sanctuary. And I get really more into my journey of coming to Christ there. You can get that stolen Bible story. Yes. I want to hear about it. I have to get the book now that I was, yeah. I was first introduced to the story and now I'm going to go get the book and read it and share it. So thank you so much. Is there anything else, Holly, you want to share before I invite you to close us in prayer today? I just want to encourage all the mamas out there. You know, this is, this is hard to hear about. And, um, you know, I becoming a mom this year, last year myself, um, there's a whole new level of um, of fear that can come up with that. And, and so um, I want to pray for all the mamas listening, but I also just want to encourage you that, um, that we can actually make a difference in this generation by having these conversations with our kids. Um, so if it's okay, I'd love to just pray for us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So Father, thank you for every single woman uh, and man who's tuned in and, and listened today. And I just pray that something said today would touch their hearts and transform their life. Um, whether it's someone who um, maybe has been watching pornography or engaged in, um, in the purchase of sex, who, who feels that conviction today that this is actually harming God's children. Um, I pray that that person would just feel empowered and emboldened to go and leave a life of sin. Um, and, to, and to find that healing and hope and renewal in Jesus. And, uh, and for anyone listening today who, who maybe fears came up about, about what their children could fall into, I pray that you would minister to that mama heart 
Um, they are doing such a good job stewarding their children. Um, I pray you would embolden them to have conversations with their young women and their young men, um, their boys and girls about how to honor and respect God's creation, um, how to honor and respect their own sexuality. And then I pray for anyone listening today who maybe has been trapped in addiction, in violence, and, and potentially even in trafficking. Um, I pray that this heart has been so broken open today that you would go and ask for help. I pray you would pray that prayer. I prayed, God help me, and that God would meet you right where you are, would send armies of angels to rescue and armies of humans to come around you as you begin the journey of healing. Thank you for this platform and this podcast and uh, bless Angela in it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.